again, this is Dr. Daniel Miola, and we're continuing our series on life-giving wounds. And we're wrapping up this first part of the series on life-giving suffering, and we're going to be talking about the subject of turning our wounds into resources with Jesus Christ. So let's begin in prayer. In the name of Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy clemency, hear and answer me. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. We take with us today all the prayers and sacrifices, in particular of the frontline workers in healthcare. I just want to give them a special shout out that you're close to us in prayers and that we're praying dearly for you. You're true inspirations and heroes to us. Now, I'd like to get into our topic of turning our wounds into resources. What does this mean? Well, we're going to look at the other half of the quote we started with yesterday. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The Lord wants to comfort us during this time. Comfort. But what is comfort? We often mistake comfort for simple pleasure. But comfort here is something deeper. Divine comfort looks a lot different than just simple pleasure or alleviating pain. Comfort in Latin comes from the word cum, with, and fort, fortis, strength, a fortress. It's a being with that strengthens us. So in particular, the comfort the Lord wants to give us is, first of all, his presence. I'll keep reiterating that, that he is with us. And his presence is like a strong fortress in the midst of the suffering. So we need to tap into that through prayer to receive the comfort the Lord wants to give us. Now, his presence, we've been talking all along, not only is he suffering with, not only is grieving, but he also wants to turn our wounds into resources of love. He never leaves us empty-handed. Okay, the biggest lie is that we're empty-handed in our suffering. There is no comfort. There is no joy. There's no hope, there's no love, etc. We're empty-handed. But we're not. The Lord is constantly working within our souls to bring about specifically faith, hope, joy, and love. Which we're going to talk about today, how we can do that. But he doesn't leave us empty-handed. We have to remember that. He wants to give us life-giving wounds. And when we say that, we, we mean specifically, especially in the context of this talk, he wants to turn our wounds into resources of faith, hope, love, and joy. Now, for shorthand, I'll just simply say resources for love, because in a certain sense, love encompasses all these other theological virtues, as we hear in 1 Corinthians 13 by Paul, who says that love is the greatest. But it's always integrated with faith, hope, and joy. I know I've added joy to the regular list. But this is fitting with the gospel. And even in 1 Corinthians 13, it says that love rejoices with the truth. And Paul elsewhere, for instance, in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, says to rejoice always. Joy should be a regular part of the Christian life. Always. But for shorthand, I'll often say that the Lord is trying to turn our wounds into resources of love. What do I mean by that? Okay. Well, and another spiritual author uh, who I really like, Father Jacques Philippe, talks about this transformation of our wounds uh, as developing interior freedom. And what does he mean by interior freedom is precisely what we're talking about. Developing faith, hope, joy, and love in response to the wound and in response to suffering. We always control our response to the suffering. And so it's important for us to develop in our wounds these resources for faith, hope, love, and joy. 
So let's talk a little bit about this. How can we have life-giving faith right now in the midst of this crisis? Well, first of all, to recognize in this crisis and any suffering is a call for Christ to deepen our union with him and to know his will in our lives. In particular, this means setting aside definitive times for prayer, certain acts of prayer, so that we can develop prayerfulness of always being aware of God's presence. I get this distinction of acts of prayer and prayerfulness uh, from a priest, and I don't know where he found it. But I think that's important to recognize that our prayer needs to have punctuated moments of acts of prayer, but what we're working towards is prayerfulness, which is always being aware of God's presence, his gaze, his love upon us, somebody to constantly turn to for inspiration throughout our day. But to have that, we have to pray sometimes. So we need to work into our new routines, our new schedules, these acts of prayer for a deeper prayerfulness so that our union is deepened. So maybe the Lord is calling to you right now through your suffering to do that, to increase his union. The other thing is he wants us to deepen our knowledge of his will for us. In particular, to develop life-giving faith, I challenge all of you to find what I call a mission in the wound. What is the particular meaning the Lord is calling to you through this suffering right now. For instance, in my own life, uh, the greatest sufferings that I've had personally, I've already mentioned the death of my grandfather and, and all my grandparents, that was a big suffering. But the other two big sufferings in my life were my parents' divorce, which was very traumatic to me, and also my wife and I struggle with infertility, permanent infertility, which has been an incredible struggle as well, as we desire to have children. But through that all, through all that suffering, we're constantly challenging ourselves, what is the mission the Lord is giving to us through this wound? So for instance, when my parents divorced, I realized very quickly the Lord was speaking through this wound to lead me to my vocation of having a strong marriage rooted in the faith and also to promote marriages and families that are strong throughout the you know, DC area, throughout the country as I'm able to. It also informed my decisions to go to the John Paul Toon Institute for Studies of Marriage and Family. But again, all of this calling came through my wound of seeing the brokenness of love. I also believe I received a call to have my home be a refuge for others that come from broken families. So regularly, my wife and I practice hospitality for those who come from broken families to be part of our family life. And also... Uh, of course, it led us to build up this ministry of life-giving wounds. But again, this was all a call that the Lord th used through my wound. And again, for us with infertility, which is our other big wound, the Lord called us very clearly after a while of grieving that we were called to adopt. And both of our children are, are adopted, and they're incredible, incredible blessings. So again, there was a particular call through our wounds. What What's the call? right now through your wounds what's the mission within the wound the lord is giving you that will deepen your faith maybe it's as simple as learning how to live redemptive suffering better as we're talking about this has happened in both of my wounds with divorce parents divorce and uh, infertility what i learned was suffering well through my parents divorce actually helped me to suffer through um, my infertility with my wife because as I suffered, I realized the greatness of having a home. And then it made me realize that with infertility, even if we're never blessed with biological children ourselves, we have this great home, this great marriage that's so important for the world to share. So again, that kind of shows how you can suffer through one thing well, and that can become a grace for later on for other suffering. So maybe the mission is to just learn more about redemptive suffering. What's the mission God's giving you through your wound? Okay, now second, we can turn our wounds into life-giving resources for hope. We can turn it, uh, our wounds into greater trust and belief that things can work out for the good of those who love God. Hope-filled people uh, follow and believe in this scripture, Matthew 18, 26, that all things are possible with God. They don't get weighed down by pessimism. 
cynicism, discouragement. These things are not from the Lord, and we should reject them. Hope-filled people, St. John Paul II said in Salvici Dolores, again, that beautiful uh, apostolic letter on salvific suffering, redemptive suffering, said that hope-filled people take this Bible verse for their main uh, inspiration. It's Romans 5, 3 to 5, which I will read. Quote, we boast of our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Commenting on this Bible verse, he says, in times of suffering, we're called to the particular virtue of perseverance. And by persevering, persevering with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, produces hope. So perseverance in Christians is never just simply grinning and getting and bearing through it. Rather, we're persevering with the Lord. It's giving hope to all around us. I think here of the wonderful testimonies of married couples who go through tons of sacrifices and pains of an unhappy marriage for 2, 3, 5, 20, 25 years. To then eventually find it all to be worth it many years later. And it instills hope in their children and in their marriage that they can work through difficulties as well. There's a beautiful book, by the way, on stories of couples who really struggled with their marriage but came out and persevered with hope uh, that I really recommend. It's called uh, Impossible Marriages Redeemed by Layla Miller. Beautiful stories of this type of perseverance we're talking about that can produce hope. But it's not just those examples. There's other examples of persevering through great suffering and pain of illness, disability, etc. Just by persevering through it with the Lord, you're giving hope. So don't underestimate that, that importance of that virtue of perseverance, of staying the course, loving your family through the bumpy waters, loving your wife, loving God, loving friends through the bumpy waters, right? Persevering. Hope is also uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. Pope Emeritus wrote a great encyclical on hope called Space Salvi. I'm actually rereading it this Lent. I think it's a very timely encyclical for us. And he says this, he says, people who have hope have a future. So that's the other thing. We want to build up hope in our life. We've got to remember our future that we have. And he has this beautiful quote that I'm going to read because it's, it's just incredible. Quote, a distinguishing mark of Christians is the fact that they have a future. It is not that they know the details of what awaits them, but they know in general terms that their life will not end in emptiness. Only when the future is certain as a positive reality does it become possible to live the present as well. The one who has hope lives differently. The one who hopes has been granted the gift of a new life. Practice hope by acknowledging that we have a positive reality that awaits us in the future. We believe to Christ, believe in Christ. We know he'll turn all things to good. So to practice hope, maybe concretely now is the time to dream again about the possibilities of the future together with your spouse. Do you have dreams? What are those dreams? To share that again with your spouse or with the Lord, that produces hope. And we need to have confidence that our life will not end in emptiness emptiness no matter what comes we have a good future ahead of us we know christ is resurrected he has victory over death and is transforming our life at every single moment along the way for the good we need to have confidence in that good future and dream again beautifully pope francis sort of helped us to enter into this this dream when he talked about the time when we'll be able to gather and hug again after all this quarantine, what a beautiful time that will be when we hug, we give a sign of peace at Mass, meet family members again, etc. He, he was helping us enter into hope, to dream again about the possibilities. We don't know the particular circumstances, but our life will never end up empty. If we have this Christian hope of belief in God, that's what Pope Benedict is calling us to. So maybe, again, use our wounds directed towards hope, transform it to hope. Okay, maybe we're being called to transform our wounds towards a resource of joy. Joy, again, 
uh, it, it can be hard to practice the virtue of joy in these circumstances, especially because we're, we're very good at anticipating future suffering, right? <laughs> Um, on top of the suffering we currently face, we anticipate some of the worst possible scenarios. That we can get coronavirus, that our family will die, etc., etc., etc. We need to stop. We need to stop that. Now, we need to take precautions. That's good. But then we can't anticipate suffering so much that it steals the joy away from these moments that the Lord gives us, for instance, with our family. A funny example is um, when our first daughter was born, Zelly. You know, we're having a heck of a time sleep training her. We're we're up all night. We're we're sleep deprived, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm never gonna get sleep again, <laughs> or at least for three or four years. You know, what did I do? I anticipated future suffering. It wasn't that bad, but that made that moment that much more difficult because I did that. So if we want to practice joy, we have to be careful of how much we're anticipating that future suffering. The other thing is we gotta watch. In the spiritual life, we can have a distrust of joy. This sounds very strange, but actually there's this phenomenon, uh, sociological literature has even pointed out, and it's called foreboding joy. Uh, one of the authors are like Brene Brown talks a lot about it. But whatever term you use, distrust of joy, foreboding joy, what that means is when things are going right, it's at that point we feel that disaster is gonna strike. And the problem with this distrust and this can arise, by the way, for many different reasons. Our upbringing, previous wounds, temperament. Maybe we watch too much news and this, this makes us anxious that bad things are going to happen all the time. Uh, I see this a lot, for instance, in my ministry. Um, but anyways, I won't go into all the reasons why. But the point is, there's a lot of distrust of joy. And the problem with this is... Instead of delighting in the good that God gives us, because he wants to give us joy. He's giving you joy, I know, right now. He never leaves us empty-handed without joy. Instead of delighting in the good, say, of playing with your kid, you're scanning the environment for all things that are wrong. You're worried about all the news, about the coronavirus, etc., and you fail to delight in the gift that God gave you. And that gift was given to you to help comfort you through the suffering. So we got to be careful. We, we got to be careful of distrusting joy. Instead, we need to delight in the good that God's given us, especially in our family members. No matter how imperfect those relations are, we need to delight in them. We need to practice gratitude. This is what Eucharist means, Thanksgiving. This has to be a hallmark of our life. And this uh, joy is not just reserved for the optimist or certain temperament, but to be a regular part of the fabric of Christian life. Christ says in John 16, 22, if you follow me, no one will take your joy from you. And St. Paul says to rejoice always. This has to be a regular part of our life. So we can't distrust the joy. We have to be aware of those moments and choose joy. But how is it possible in this time to have joy again, you say? Well, again, God gives you all these moments. You can delight, you can have gratitude, but joy can take uh, many forms. Fundamentally, it's being aware of the gifts God is giving you. Because again, so often we can push those away. And this is why uh, the gospel, sorry, the scriptures talk about a joy of redemptive suffering. Joy can also come from the meaning and the purpose and witness that we have during this time. But the scriptures talk about joy of redemptive suffering. When we suffer redemptively, we shouldn't go around like moping and mourning. Okay, there's a, there's a place for sadness. But it shouldn't be all the time. We should also allow joy into this redemptive suffering. And here in Acts 5.41 describes this joy of redemptive suffering very beautifully. So they left the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they had been found worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name of Christ. End quote. Acts 5.41. They rejoiced that they had been found worthy to suffer joy of redemptive suffering right there. That's the disciples. So the joy can take uh, many forms, some of which we've already talked about. Another one that we haven't talked yet about is rejoicing in the, the gifts of others. Do you know somebody who's getting married? Still rejoice and celebrate with them. Ask them to live stream it on the internet so you can partake in their joy from afar. Maybe somebody got pregnant in the midst of all this. Rejoice with them from afar. Maybe there's a birthday. Rejoice with them from afar in your home. 
Rejoice at the good of others. Or your, your children or friend or roommate. Affirm a good trait in them. Rejoice in those good traits. Other times you can find joy in serving others. There's lots of ways we can serve right now. And this joy of serving others is beautifully proclaimed in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, which is such a beautiful uh, quote that maybe a lot of you already know, that God loves what? A cheerful giver. There's cheer in giving. So there's a lot of different ways to find joy. So my spiritual mentor, who uh, I love a lot, Father Dan Leary, would always say, trust the joy, doubt the doubt in those moments of joy. In other words, delight in the joy, trust the joy in those moments God gives you, and doubt the doubt. God wants to give you joy. Receive it. And finally, life-giving love. We can turn our wounds into life-giving love. Now, we're going to talk a lot more about life-giving love later, so I'm going to just say three quick points, but we'll go much deeper into turning our wounds into life-giving love later in this series. But here, let me just say, how can we turn our wounds into resources of love very briefly, um, I think Pope Benedict XVI said it beautifully that our capacity to love corresponds to our capacity to suffer and to suffer well together. It's interesting. Our capacity to love corresponds to our ability to suffer and to suffer well together. I found this in my life that my love has been strengthened through suffering through trials with my wife. And afterwards, we can look back and really say, wow, that's really deepened our love. With infertility in particular, trials of my parents' divorce, or whatever sufferings might be that we've encountered with the poor, the elderly, the sick, all the people that we've accompanied in this life, and all the relational broken that we accompany. We find that as we suffer well together, our love is strengthened. So maybe it's just, again, Suffering through this time together will be its own grace of love. But also, our wounds can be transformed in love by recognizing that this suffering is given to us to have greater solidarity with all those who suffer, especially similar wounds to us. We have a special solidarity and a special compassion for those who have similar wounds to us. We need to love those who have similar wounds to us. It's a very important part of turning our wounds into resources of love. Also, during times of suffering, it can make us realize maybe the absence of love. And at this time, we're called to be even more intentional about love. So that, that suffering of the absence of love that maybe we feel is a call to be even more intentional. Not take love for granted, but to deepen it, to strengthen it, and not run away from it. So to grieve, to have compassion, to to empathize, to develop your relationship with your spouse and family, etc. It's never too late. To do these things well. And then finally, another way um, here initially of turning our wounds into resources of love is as you do this work of turning your wounds into resources, you learn the pathway of healing. This, this is really the deepest level of healing is to turn our wounds into these resources of love. And you need to share that. You need to share that pathway with others. I don't care where you're at on that pathway. God will send you another you at wherever your point is in that pathway. And you need to talk to them about it. Maybe it's sharing this video series. Maybe it's sharing some truths about this series. Whatever. Share the pathway of healing that you've already been given with another. It's crucial. We do this healing work for not just ourselves and our families, but with the world. So we need to share it. Because there's some people that only you can reach. God gives each one of us only certain people that only we can reach. So these are all different ways we can transform our wounds into resources of faith, hope, joy, and love. I hope I gave you some practical tips to implement. And I want to leave you with this uh, last image. that the, the image for life-giving wounds and the image of transforming our wounds into resources of love should really be the resurrected Christ. Why? Because what's so beautiful is the resurrected Christ still has his wounds. Isn't that fascinating? Even though we know that there's going to be no more pain, suffering, and death in heaven, the resurrected Christ still has his wounds. Why? How does this make sense? Well, he still has his wounds because in the resurrection, 
They've now been transformed into God's glory. So he doesn't have to get rid of them. They're part of God's glory. They're part of God's love. So that's got to be our image. We need to be people that are resurrected. And yes, we may still have wounds, but allow your wounds to be resources of love, transformed into God's glory in the different ways we're talking about. Let that be your image. And I'll conclude really quickly with a saint story. It won't be as long as yesterday because I don't want to go too far over the time allotment of 20, 30 minutes. This saint um, was a saint during a plague. And he administered so well with love, turning the wound of that society, the wound of the plague, into love, that the people that he ministered to in the city of Milan actually named the plague after him and called the plague St. Charles Plague. Now, this might sound crazy to name a plague after a saint, but it was actually an honor. It was an honor because the people remember not only the death that the plague brought, but the love that this priest, this archbishop brought as well. His name was St. Charles Borromeo. And that is that, that renaming of the plague is exactly the transformative work that we're talking about. It's turning something negative, suffering plague, into also a reminder of love such that it becomes St. Charles' plague. So that, that's that beautiful transformative work that we're talking about, turning our wounds into resources of love. What did he do? Well, just very briefly, he did a lot. But the most noble thing that he did was at the height of the plague, it was the bubonic plague, the most deadly plague ever in the history of man. Killed, I think the estimates are 75 to 200 million people. But in his city alone, Killed, I think, uh, here I have the statistics, 20,000 of the 60,000 to 70,000 people in the city of Milan. In the midst of this plague, he didn't leave the city. The government left. The nobles left. But he didn't leave. He stayed. He remained with people. He wrote his will, fully expecting to die, and went out and served the people. He organized hospitals. He organized workers. He organized orphanages for the kids who lost both parents. He closed the doors of the churches and put altars outside in the square to do mass outdoors so people could witness the mass from the windows of their apartments along the square from the distance. Not much unlike the TV masses that we're experiencing today by, by priests out there, or all the priests who are faithfully celebrating private masses for the parishioners. He did... Um, processions through the street again without anybody he just took the eucharist he just let the people know that christ is with him he took a relic holy nail etc to let him know that he was with them and yes he even did some heroic things like uh, one amazing story was he climbed up a pile of dead bodies to get to a man who was dying to give them to give him last rites now, we can't do that. Uh, we have to practice social distancing, but we can learn from St. Charles Borromeo. We can be in solidarity with those who suffer, right? We can help the healthcare workers. We can donate to hospitals. Some people are selling masks. Some people are creating uh, the face shields. Uh, we can pray for them, certainly. We can offer spiritual support from afar through videos like this, through conversations, etc. But that that's turning our wounds into the resources of love, like St. Charles Borromeo, so much so that a plague was named after him. So following his example, let us not waste our pain. Let's help our families and others who are suffering as well. So my question I want to end with you is, how do you think your wound can become a resource? What can you do to make it into a resource for others, in particular, a resource for love, faith, hope, and joy. We need to do this work because a uh, quote I love by Saint, not Saint, by Sister Miriam James says, Our wounds are either transformed or transmitted. Our wounds are either transformed or transmitted. Choose to have them transformed. Don't transmit them. 
So, with the help of the resurrected Christ, let us pray to have life-giving wounds of hope, faith, joy, and love. Let us conclude in prayer. Anima Christi, soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from Christ's side, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Suffer me not to be separated from thee. From the malicious enemy, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me. And bid me come unto thee, that I may praise thee with thy saints and with thy angels forever and ever. Amen. to